The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, this is Dylan Jones and welcome to another Frontier Precision webinar. Uh, today we have a Jay Haskamp presenting a special case study that looks at the differences between aerial, mobile, and traditional survey workflows. And so without uh, any further ado, I'll let Jay take it away from here. Okay, thanks Dylan. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen and hear me okay. Um, just want to thank everybody for attending today and, and welcome me here. So a couple quick things before we get started. Um, for those of you that are attending and watching this, um, you should have an option to ask a question and I believe there's also a chat box option. So how we want to handle this is um, I have Dylan in the background kind of monitoring things. I also have Nathan Stevenson out of our office in Arvada, Colorado with us today as well. Um, these two guys are kind of our residential experts on the on the mobile and, and the uh, aerial LIDAR. So I have them here to kind of help out with questions. And if you have a, uh, a quick question, you just want to ask one of them and, and get answered right away, feel free to put that into the chat window as they can, they can see and monitor that. Otherwise, um, we will be taking questions um, throughout the, the presentation, but we'll be waiting till the end um, of the presentation to go through them. So if you put the questions um, that you may have into the questions box, um, Dylan and, and Nathan can't see those, only I can see those, so we'll cover those at the end. So again, if you want something kind of quick um, and, and easy, put it in the chat. Otherwise, if you want to wait till the end um, with a more complicated question or something like that, feel free to put it in the questions box and we'll address that when we're done. So. Um, so today we're going to talk about a um, project that we did here um, where we're comparing uh, various things, I guess, you, you could put it with uh, aerial um, data, so photogrammetry and aerial LIDAR, and then mobile LIDAR, and kind of comparing it to traditional survey workflows to um, look at several things um, versus time to collect data, time to process, the quality of the data, and things like that. So hopefully um, you guys will find this beneficial and, and hopefully um, there'll be some good information in here for you. So uh, a little bit about myself. Here I am on the screen here. If you haven't met me, I've, I'm in Frontier Precision in our St. Cloud, uh, Minnesota office. Um, I've been around for a while, so I feel like I know most of our customer base, but I know there's people um, outside of our territory in here as well. But I've been with Frontier for 12 years, and I've been in the, the surveying engineering kind of industry since uh, 2002. Um, so I have some background in that industry before I, before I started here. And so let's move on to our um, project here. So a little background on the, the scope of this project or what we're trying to accomplish here. So first was to... Um, go out and perform a topographic survey of a roadway um, using various different technologies. And the first thing we needed to do to kind of have a fair comparison is we needed to put out a solid control network um, that we can tie all of our data to, we can register all of our data to. So um, having a solid control network, I feel, was kind of the, the biggest uh, key component to this whole project. So we spent a lot of time making sure we had that right. Then we went out and conducted a, a survey with a robotic total station um, to basically create road cross sections, um, line work, and a surface model. And the, topo, uh, the topographic survey with the total station was going to be kind of our benchmark um, to compare everything to. Because when we look at traditional survey methods, um, a total station is typically seen as being a more accurate method than, than say, using GPS. So we wanted to really just make sure that all of our baseline comparison data um, was was really tight and accurate and um, it was a was a good uh, data set to use to compare everything to. Then we went out and conducted additional surveys. So we did a cross-section survey using um, GNSS off of a base station. We did a photogrammetry survey. Uh, we did an aerial LIDAR survey and then we did a mobile LIDAR survey. And with all those different surveys that we did, we use the data to produce the same line work um, and the same surface models. So we had kind of an apples to apples comparison of everything. With the data, we went and compared items such as, you know, how much time does it take to um, collect the data? How much time does it take to produce the data? 
Um, what's the quality of the data? If we compare, you know, uh, the quality of the point cloud or the quality of the uh, the images, things like that, um, the data accuracy and um, just the efficiency. So how fast can we, you know, get this done from start to finish? And then we just wanted to produce some some hopefully thorough and uh, honest findings for everybody based on what we found. So um, this the goal of this isn't to say use this or use that because they all kind of have their time in place. It's just more or less to um, get everything in the same playing field here and just produce information for you guys to look at and, and make some determinations on. So what is our goal um, for doing all this? Obviously we worked really hard on this. I spent a lot of time on this, had a lot of help. Um, first and foremost, we just wanted to determine how these technologies um, measure up to traditional methods. They're kind of this new cutting edge emerging technology. Um, everybody's talking about it, but there's not a lot of information on just how this stuff all compares. So we wanted to definitely determine that. And then we've never really thoroughly tested these technologies and compared them to how we currently do things. You know, we'll get the mobile scanner here at the office and we'll say, oh, let's go out and scan something and it looks great, but we never really sit down and um, really thoroughly take a look at it and just to see like, okay, what's good and what's bad about this. And we were finally able to utilize all these tools. So obviously, you know, mobile scanners and aerial lighters aren't something that's always readily available. Um, and it just kind of worked out at one point in time, we had all of our sensors in Minnesota and just decided to kind of jump on the opportunity. And that's kind of how this thing, this thing uh, ballooned up from there. So we want to answer some questions. First one would be, you know, can we be more efficient in how we um, how we do things? Are there more cost-effective uh, methods of collecting and producing data with these sensors? Are they accurate enough for what we're trying to do or or the situation that we're working in? And then, are there any additional um, hurdles or things that we will encounter we will, we will encounter um, with these technologies? And we definitely had a few. Um, bumps in the road um, and that's that's valuable information as well because it's kind of those things that you don't really know um, until you get into it um, that you're going to have to deal with. So what sensors did we use um, for kind of our baseline data set? We used the Trimble S7. It was just a three second pretty standard uh, robot. We tried to use uh, tools that we figure most of our customers would use on a daily basis. So a three second S7 uh, with the TSC7 you know, running the latest uh, version of Axis at the time, which was 2019.1. The um, GNSS survey, we used a Trimble R10 Model 2. Um, this was pre-ProPoint, uh, so um, we always have a discussion on, okay, what's the next iteration or the next level of this, but um, I'd like to try it again with like an R12 with ProPoint. But for what we did, we had an R10 Model 2 uh, TSC7, and again, Access 2019. So the same same controller and software were used for both surveys. Then when we move on to the other sensors, um, for our photogrammetry, we used a, a DJI M200, version two was the airframe. And then on there, we used a PPK system from uh, Cloud Geomatics. So Cloud is somebody that um, I've, I've known Rob for a little while now. We've had a good relationship with Cloud and they, they make a solid system. So we put that to the test and that PPK system integrates on the um, M200 with a, with a Sony RX1 R2 camera. So we had a custom gimbal and we're able to run a really nice Sony camera on that photogrammetry system. So that's what we use for that survey. The uh, aerial LiDAR was a DJI M600. And for that uh, LiDAR sensor, we use the yellow scan VX20. Uh, we'll dive more into that in a minute, but that's the uh, kind of our, our aerial LiDAR sensor that we use here at Frontier. And then uh, I had to throw a little picture of Dylan in there since he was kind of my moderator today, but uh, this was when we were setting up our MX-9. So it's the dual laser um, MX-9. This was actually a picture from the day that we, uh, that we did the scan. So method to our madness, what, what are we trying to do here and, and why are we doing what we're doing? So, you know, I've done a lot of research on this. We've looked at a lot of different, um, how do I say, different uh, options or uh, I don't want to say case studies, but different studies or, or things people have done and published online. And it seems like anybody can kind of make this as easy as they want. 
Um, a lot of times you see just kind of a bare bones test and people don't really want to dive into it and spend a lot of time on it. But we wanted to make sure that, you know, if we were going to put the time in on this, we wanted to really work in a real world scenario that's going to have various hurdles and challenges um, that are part of it. We didn't go out kind of looking for problems, but we wanted to put ourselves in a situation that, say, a customer of ours would be in. So a couple of things that we took into consideration was, do we do a curved road or a straight road? So you can kind of see the snippet from the uh, the aerial on the screen here. This is the road we did um, in St. Cloud. It's actually right by our office here. And we chose to work on a curved road because that poses various challenges. Because when you start you know, running out line work um, along a linear road, it's easy to just kind of push lines out, you know, at, you know, 100 foot intervals or whatever and just kind of make adjustments and go but when you get into a curved road it just kind of makes things a little bit more difficult when you're trying to say look at point cloud cross sections and things like that so we wanted to make sure that you know we we worked on a nice curvy road and this road is pretty much just one continuous curve uh, we also wanted to work in a project that had curb and gutter versus a rural road a lot of these roads that we see are just long straight roads with a paved surface and a shoulder and a ditch um, we really were interested in the curb and gutter information as well as you can see on the image there's a lot of parking lot entrances and things like that coming into that road that you know that we would have to deal with so that's something that we deliberately wanted to uh, to look at and then probably the biggest one that can be kind of a pain <clears throat> when processing this data is we wanted to work in a local coordinate system um, in Minnesota here where, we're, where I'm located you know, every one of our counties within our state has its own coordinate system. So this was done in, in Stearns County. So we wanted to work um, in that local projection because that's what literally 99% of people in Minnesota work in is in a county system. Now, those of you who have any experience um, with LIDAR, whether it's aerial or mobile, or especially photogrammetry, know that if you're working in local sites, there's a lot of hurdles and things you got to deal with. Um, so we knew that going into this, but we were bound and determined to kind of figure out how to make it work. We actually learned some stuff um, along the way, which hopefully I'll, I'll remember and share with you that that actually kind of helped us out. So this is kind of what we wanted to, to deal with because we figured this would be a typical scenario. All right, so the control survey we did, um, just a little bit of background on this. Um, you know, we knew we needed a solid control network. Hopefully you can see the image on there. Um, this is the control network we used. It was based off of a previous network um, that we had in place that was established from two nearby Harn points. So we moved to this new office in about a year and a half ago. And one of the first things I did was I set a bunch of control around our facility here. And where we're at, we're lucky enough, we have more than more control than we could ever need. We have Harn points all over the place. So we tied our office control network into two hard points. We ran a, through it with a digital level. And we have a really solid network here. Um, so if you look on the screen, you can see over here is point number one. Point number one is kind of the common point. So what I mean by that is our control network around our office, point number one is kind of our anchor point. That's what we use for our, our uh, vertical benchmark when we ran our level loop and things like that. So this network for this project is anchored off of um, point number one, which is kind of our, our benchmarks. We wanted to make sure that these tied together uh, more just for redundancy if we needed to tie back into that network. But we wanted to make sure that we were using um, something that we knew was good. And then we also have this WP or WTPK um, point up here. That's actually our base station on our building, which is part of the Minnesota VRS network. And the reason why it was important to incorporate that point in is because that's the base station we processed all of our data off of. So we had to make sure that that was, you know, adjusted as part of our network. So we established our control network. We figured out what we wanted to do. The primary control um, was established just using a static survey. So we did a static session on all the, all the points, processed the baselines, did a network adjustment, and got all of our uh, horizontal positions locked down. And then we went out to go level through it. We didn't have a, a digital level at the time, but we took an SX10 out, which is a one second robot. And then we used the level me module within access and, and ran a trig level through um, all of our control. And, and I'll show you, we're actually very pleased with the results that we um, received off of that. And then once our primary control was all adjusted and leveled through, uh, we used the SX10 and set out some additional control because we knew um, 
doing the total station survey, we would need some more points out there. So we made sure that we, you know, we used measure rounds for everything and we tied everything in. So we had, you know, mean turned angles and things like that. So here's just a picture of, of what our uh, control targets looked like on the road. So we went out and we set um, PK nails along the road in, in pairs. So there's one on either side. I think we had four um, pairs. And then we painted these white chevrons um, with the PK nails at the, at the tip of the chevron. And I actually ordered some of the reflective glass beads from Amazon and we put those in the paint to make them more reflective. And then we painted some, some black around the outside just to try to get some more contrast to make them pop. So this is one of the uh, R10s we used for the control survey um, running the static session on one of our points. And then this is the um, just some of the, the data. So you can see here's our baseline processing report of our um, control and then these are the the adjusted grid coordinates running it through the network adjustment and then again you can see our level our, our ramus closure was actually like three ten thousandths of a foot so it was pretty much flat so very minimal um, adjustment run through there but this was all put together to establish our network so once that was done um, we moved on to the cross-section survey so again, we wanted to use something that we knew our customers would be using. So again, it's just that uh, S7 with the uh, MT1000 um, prism. So it's just a standard multi-track prism. And then we used our control network and we only did station setups. We wanted to avoid resection. So every setup was, was over a known point and back sighting a known point. And then for added um, redundancy or Maybe we're just a little too anal about this stuff, but we did a compensator calibration at every setup just to make sure that we took any you know, leveling issues out of play. And then all the topography or cross-section measurements we took were done in phase one and phase two. And the reason we did that was just for um, extra redundancy and accuracy. So we didn't have any you know, randomly bad shots in there that you know, if, if we shot phase one and then phase two and got an auto tolerance message, we could look at it and say, okay, is it within what we want it to be? or do we want to discard it and, and do it over? So the cross sections we took were roughly at 100 foot intervals. And then the measurements we took were from back of curb um, to back of curb. So we didn't really want to focus on, you know, utilities or signs or lights or trees. We we're more just worried about uh, road information. So we just went from back of curb to back of curb. The GNSS survey. Um, you can see on the pictures, this was a fun day. Um, we kind of, we didn't collect the data in this order. We kind of collected it as, as time permitted. And the GNSS survey, we, we got caught by surprise. Um, typical fall in Minnesota, it's sunny and 40, 50 degrees one day, and then we get two feet of snow the next day. So um, we had to improvise, but we um, used an R10 Model 2 TSC7 running Trimble Access. So we could have ran VRS because um, we have a VRS network here in Minnesota, um, but just because we were processing all of our other sensors off of our base station, um, we um, decided that we wanted to do a full RTK survey and get our corrections from our base station as well so everything was consistent. So we found our control targets on the road, um, dug them out, um, found our PK nails and, and did a calibration. So we were on the same um, network or control as our, as our targets were. And then we did cross sections about every 30 feet. So you can see we got caught with the snow. Um, that's me with the rod in the background. And, and some of you may know who Tony is, one of our other uh, AGEs here in St. Cloud. Um, he was there with his shovel and his ice chisel and uh, helping me. You can kind of see the picture on the lower right hand corner there. We were chiseling out the curb and gutter um, to make sure we got down to the uh, to the right surfaces. But again, because of this, we only we only went back a curb to back a curb. But we feel we got we feel we got the necessary data for what we needed to do there. Photogrammetry survey. So again, use the M200 with the Clow 7700 PPK system. Um, the Sony camera, it's a 42 megapixel camera, full frame sensor. It's a great camera for, for photogrammetry. Um, it was just a single grid flight, 75 meters was the, was the um, height we flew at with a 70% and a 75% overlap. So the uh, PPK was processed off of our, um, our Wake Park course site on the building. And the, um, the data was tied to our ground control points that we set 
you know, on the ground, we could see the targets. Um, you can actually kind of see in the image here, they might be small, but you can see our target pairs here, uh, here. We actually had point number one here, here, and here. And then we processed the data um, two ways, actually. We processed the data um, locally on the computer. We processed it um, in PIX4D, and then we processed it up in the cloud using um, Dell Air AI, Dell Air's cloud-based platform, because we wanted to see um, just kind of two different ways. We had the data. It, it didn't hurt to, uh, to run it through a different uh, variation. And then the data was processed in our, in our local projection and our, in our vertical datum. The aerial LIDAR survey, um, again, that was the M600 with the yellow scan uh, VX20, which has a Regal sensor on it. Um, you can see in the map there, we basically had two flight lines. We flew kind of the outer edge of the road and then the, the inner edge of the road. Um, the GPS and the IMU was processed in POSPAC, again, off of the uh, Waite Park base station. And then the LAS files that we created were with Yellowscan's uh, cloud station software. So that's their kind of their LAS processing um, software. And then this is where we kind of ran into our first hurdle. So we had trouble um, exporting out the data in our local coordinate system. So we tried, there's some, there's some options in there to create custom um, projections or custom exports. We didn't spend a lot of time on it, but we never really got it to work. We were doing something wrong, but we found out um, that TBC, just kind of playing around, TBC actually solved the problem for us. So what we what we found out is that um, TBC has the ability to reproject point clouds, which which is a pretty powerful tool. So the way we kind of got around this was we exported out our LAS files in Minnesota State Plain, and then we created a TBC project in Minnesota State Plain and brought them in. And then all we had to do was simply go to our project settings and change the coordinate system to our local site and TBC reprojected and, and adjusted our point cloud. We brought our control file in, it fell right in where it should, and then we geo-referenced the point cloud to our control in TBC. So um, TBC certainly saved the day for us there. And then lastly, the mobile LiDAR survey. So this was the MX-9 dual lasers, 360 degree camera as a side camera, as a rear camera. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but for those of you that have mobile mapping experience with the MX-9, you know, you have to kind of warm up and calibrate the IMU and the GNSS. So um, Dylan took it out on a nearby highway and just drove around for 10 minutes or so and got things all kind of oriented and ready to go. And then when we actually had him drive this road, he drove, I think it was actually 18 miles an hour is what we figured it out to be, but right around 20 miles an hour and collected 1,600 feet of data in just under a minute. So um, you can see on the screen there, that's the whole mobile mapping project. The ends are cut off a little bit, but he, he got all that in under a minute. We brought that data in and processed the trajectory and the IMU, GNSS, all that into POSPAC. And then you bring all that data into TBC and using TBC's mobile mapping uh, module, we processed everything in TBC, created the, the LAS files and so on. All right, so let's talk about um, data collection times. So try to explain a little bit what we're looking at here. I wanted to put this on graphs um, so you can kind of see what we have going on here, but we have our mobile LiDAR, our aerial LiDAR, photogrammetry, and then our GNSS um, topography survey. So the question is, is how long did it take to capture all this data? So we have two aspects of this. We have, um, the physical time it took to collect the data, which is what is in white, but we also have the total time, which is in red. So that includes kind of the other things that aren't part of the data collection. So to break this down, we'll start at the bottom and work up. The topography survey with the GNSS um, took us an hour and 31 minutes. So with that, we were doing two second topo shots. We weren't doing rapid points. Um, that included calibrating to our control um, targets on site and then doing our cross sections from back of curb to back of curb, and then any extra detail on the you know parking lot entrances and things like that. This does not include any time um, shoveling snow and chiseling ice. They actually were able to stay ahead of me, so I didn't have to wait for them. So this is just purely, um, whoops, purely data collection time. The photogrammetry portion of this, 
Um, the actual data capture time was only eight minutes. So it was an eight minute flight, but there was also 22 minutes of, you know, mission planning, setting it up, you know, tearing it down, things like that. So the total time um, for the photogrammetry flight was about 30 minutes. The aerial LIDAR, um, the flight itself was 15 minutes. So we fly a little bit, a little bit lower and a little bit slower to get, you know, the density that we were looking for. So the flight was a little bit longer, but it had a little bit more of a setup time. And, you know, honestly, part of that was, is when we got the system, nothing was put together. So we had to mount the antenna, we had to mount the, the bracketing and everything like that. So that probably took a little bit longer than normal, but the setup time was about an hour and uh, 12 minutes. So the total time for the aerial LIDAR flight or aerial LIDAR survey was an hour and 27 minutes. And then lastly, with the MX-9, um, you can see the actual data capture. I just rounded it up to one minute, but we had a uh, an hour and 11 minutes of setup time. So that was, you know, mounting the uh, the bracketing and the mounting on the vehicle, mounting the, you know, the MX-9 on that, um, taking it out on the highway and driving it around to do the calibration and then tearing it down and putting it all, uh, putting it all back. So the total amount of time there uh, for the MX-9 was an hour and 12 minutes. So, you know, what did we learn here? Um, you know, we look at this and, you know, except for the photogrammetry portion of it, everything was, was pretty much even, it was pretty even. So we're kind of trying to digest this and figure out, okay, what, what are we, what are we getting from this? Like, what are we understanding here? And, you know, if you look at it, this was only a 1600 foot um, section of road. So if we look at it, there's really no reason to choose, say, a, a, you know, an, an MX-9 over GNSS if you're just talking about time. Now, there's other things we have to consider there, but these things were all pretty even. So we had to ask ourselves, it's like, well, what do we need to um, do to determine how, you know, if this is more beneficial one way or the other? So we figured we need to project this out. So we looked at 1,600 feet. You know, what does it take to do um, a mile or what does it take to do two and a half miles or what does it take to do five miles? So we sat down and we started crunching numbers um, to figure out as we get on these longer projects, you know, how, how these things kind of start to set themselves apart from the others. So here's the, uh, the slide to show that. Um, so there's a lot going on here, but the information in white is what it took us at 1600 feet. The information in red is the time to do a mile. The information in blue is the time to do two and a half miles and the information in green is the time to do five miles. We had to think of each um, each thing kind of individually to determine what that time would be. So to start with the GNSS down on the bottom, that was pretty easy. We know, okay, it took us an hour and 31 minutes to collect this data by hand. If we're in a scenario with a road similar to what we're doing, we're likely going to have cross streets. We're likely going to have the same amount of parking lot entrances and the same, you know, the same type of data to collect. So there was just simple math. So we, with with the amount of time it took us to do uh, 1,600 feet, we calculated to do a mile would be about five hours. To do two and a half miles would be about 12 and a half hours, and to do five miles would be about 25 hours to do this all by hand. Then we move up to the uh, M200 with the photogrammetry. And when we got into the, the photogrammetry part of this, we actually um, selected a similar road and actually did flight plans to get hard data from the flight plan software as to you know times that it would take to do this. But the other thing we had to consider here was, um, you know, you're not gonna get all these flights or these, these surveys done in one flight. So what you see here is like this little 2F in parentheses. That means that it would take two flights to accomplish that. So the other thing we had to think about is, okay, if I'm gonna do this in two flights, um, I have to factor in a battery change. You know, so how long does that take? So I talked to a couple of our drone guys and we kind of came to the consensus that to bring a drone in, land it, swap the battery, take it back off and 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 restart where you left off is we'll just figure on average about 10 minutes. So for every flight change, we factored in 10 minutes in there for a battery swap. So for the M200 to do 1600 feet, we're at 30 minutes. Now, when we push that out to a mile, we have to do two flights to make that happen. So we have one battery change. So technically to collect data in a mile, um, you know, we're at 40 minutes, but we had to throw 10 minutes in for a battery change. 
The other thing I should mention here too is for the longer um, setups, we're not adding any additional time from this slide from the install mount because you're only going to do that once, right? You're only going to set it up once, you plan once, and tear down once. So these numbers are consistent. They're not getting any bigger. All we're looking at is strictly the, the collection times as we're projecting this out for different distances. The only thing that we did not include in here for any of the aerial stuff would be time moving from one place to the other because you have variables with um, you know visual line of sight and maybe having to move down the road a mile so you can see the next section. We didn't take any of that into consideration. It was strictly the data collection. So just keep that in mind. Um, so with the M200 out at two and a half miles, now we're at about an hour and a half with three flights. And when we get out to five miles, we're out about two hours and 40 minutes, and that's with five um, battery changes. Now we're thinking, okay, well, who's going to fly five miles with an M200 You know, for photogrammetry? You may have somebody that'll do it. But once you're starting to push that distance out, you may be looking into more of a fixed wing solution. So we figured we better um, also, we didn't collect data with it, but we better figure out... Um, you know, just for a fixed wing. So we, we have the UX11 as one of our platforms that we use. So we figured we better check that as well. So the values with the UX11 came out, you know, 28 minutes, hour and 37 minutes in one flight, uh, 58 minutes. This was right on the bubble of doing it, oops, of doing it in one flight. But we figured, you know, you might have wind, you might have things like that. So we broke it into two. And then five miles would be about an hour and 20 minutes with two flights with the, so you, you have a comparison between a, you know, a rotor solution and a, a fixed wing solution here. The aerial LIDAR, obviously gonna take a little bit longer, right? Because we're gonna fly it lower and we're gonna probably fly it a lot slower than photogrammetry. So 1600 feet, we had our hour and 27 minutes. You can see as we push out into a mile, we're about an hour and 50 with two flights two and a half miles, about two hours and 40 minutes with three flights. And then five miles are about four and a half hours um, with seven flights. So that would be, you know, six battery changes. And then the mobile LIDAR, um, we thought, well, we did it at 18 miles an hour. Let's figure it out at 30 miles an hour. Really didn't make that much of a difference. Um, but you can see we're at an hour 12 versus an hour and 11 minutes. At one mile, we're at an hour 15 versus an hour 13, two and a half miles an hour 20 versus an hour 16 and then at five miles an hour 28 I keep clicking here sorry an hour 28 versus an hour 21 so you know if we look at it from a perspective of the longest case scenario five miles you know we're at about an hour and a half or less with mobile we're at about four and a half hours with aerial lidar you know we're anywhere from an hour and 20 to two hours and 40 depending upon what we used for uh, photogrammetry and then for a GNSS survey, doing it by hand, we're at about 25 hours. So that's kind of how everything is, is stacking up time-wise. All right, so we had the data collected. Um, we had all of our information on you know, what's involved with it and how long it takes. Now we need to um, check the data and, and look it over and, and see how everything kind of worked out um, when, when we validate the data. So. We decided mostly to focus on the vertical results because that seems to be what everybody's interested in and that's the easiest to, to look at. So we were like, okay, what are we gonna use for our, our pass fail? What are we gonna call good? What are we gonna call not good? And initially we just came up with this number of two centimeters and there really wasn't any scientific reasoning behind this. It was just like, oh, well, the RTK spec for vertical was two centimeters, let's just use that because people would maybe use GPS. So that's where we started. Um, so about six, seven hundredths of a foot. And then um, I attended a presentation from a gentleman with, with uh, the Minnesota DOT's um, um, photogrammetry uh, division. And in Minnesota DOT, the photogrammetry people, they process the drone data, but they also process the, the aerial and mobile LIDAR data. And he gave a presentation about what they do at MnDOT. And I had a good conversation with them afterwards and he gave me this um, table, and this is what MnDOT uses. So this is uh, MnDOT's standards for mobile and aerial LIDAR and UAS. And these are based off of you know, AS, PRS, formulas, and things like that. So um, you can see 95% confidence and, and not to exceed. So this is kind of what, um, what they're looking for here. So I thought that's probably a better benchmark for us to use. 
So in the end, what we decided to do was compare all of our data, not only to the to this you know two centimeter um, threshold, but we decided we're also going to compare it at a tenth of a foot and two tenths of a foot, um, just to see you know because for some projects a tenth may be may be good enough. You know maybe some projects you need two centimeters, maybe some projects two tenths is good enough. So we wanted to make sure we just kind of covered it all. So that was that was what we decided on for validating our data. And then how do we do that? So we isolated the point clouds um, down to just the roadway. And then what we did was we extracted out the uh, the ground to remove any you know people or bicycles or whatever. And then we created full resolution surface model. So typically, you know, if you're making a surface model of a of a road with LIDAR, you're probably gonna sample it down to every couple of feet or half a foot or whatever, but we wanted to just compare raw data. We didn't want sampling to have an effect on this. So we just went full on resolution, made surface models, and then used that for our comparison. And then what we did is we compared those surface models to the control points that we set for targets along the road. And then we also compared them to our um, total station cross sections um, to see how the surface models hit with our kind of our benchmark baseline data. So what we did is we compared those using the points to surface tool in TBC, and then we determined how many checks fell within the two centimeters, the one tenth or the two uh, tenths of a foot. The other thing we had to factor in here was was the data processing time. So for the GPS data or GNSS data, the processing time took me two hours and 51 minutes. So this is bringing the data into TBC, um, processing the line work, making sure that we're detailing all the curves and the entrances so we have a nice you know arc through all of our points as we go around the curve. You can see we have some nice... Um, curves going into the entrances, you know, making break lines and things like that, and then creating the surface model. Now, I'm sure a lot of you could probably do this a lot faster, you know, in a CAD product, project, uh, CAD product, excuse me, like Civil 3D or something like that. But again, just in the terms of consistency, I wanted to do everything in Trimble Business Center. So we're, you know, everything's being done in the same place. So this took us two hours and 51 minutes. And then looking at the data, you know, we all know what it looks like, so there's nothing really fancy or to show here, but just some information, we end up with about 622 measurements um, outside, and then varying levels of horizontal and vertical precision, but at the 95% confidence level, the vast majority of them were, were fixed under a tenth of a foot. Now, taking that surface model that we created from the GNSS cross sections, we... Um, compared it to the control points that we um, had on the road. So there's a couple different things going on here. First, the um, points that were that fell outside of our two centimeter, we have marked here with a, with a little red star. And then the points that fell outside of a tenth of a foot are marked with the blue star. So you can see, as an example, points three, four, and six were over a tenth. And then points seven and 10 were within a tenth, but over the two centimeter mark. And then the other distinction I wanna make here is these three points that are highlighted in yellow, those are actually points that we used in our calibration in the field. So we use 0.5, uh, which is, where's 0.5? Over here, we used 0.2, which is over here, and we used 0.8, which is over here, and then we also factored in 0.16 and some other stuff here. but for our control points, these three points, obviously they hit really well because they were part of our um, part of our calibration. I just wanted for each one of these to just cut a quick cross section just so you can kind of see um, what, the, what that looks like. And every one of these cross sections you'll see is at the exact same spot on the road. What we wanted to do here when we looked at the cross section data was I picked a spot where we had um, a GPS cross section that was in the exact same spot as the total station cross section. So what we actually did when we did the total station and the GPS cross sections is I had drawn a map and I had drawn lines um, along the alignment, like cross section lines. And we did our cross sections on those lines to try to keep um, that consistent. So we weren't comparing a total station cross section to a GNSS cross section that were 30 feet away that they're right on top of each other. So, um, the green is a total station surface and the red is a GNSS. So you can see it matches up, matches up very well. Now this slide is 
when we take our surface model from our GNSS cross sections and we run a compar comparison to our total station cross section measurements. So we're not comparing two surfaces, we're comparing the physical total station measurements that we took to the GNSS surface, okay? So what we have here is points that fall outside of two centimeters are gonna be marked in red. So out of our 79 checks that we had, 58 of them fell within two centimeters. So 73% of, um, of our checks fell within two centimeters. 87% of our checks, or 69 out of 79, fell within a tenth. And all but one, we had one kind of outlier up here, which is really high. I'm not, I have to look at what happened there. But that one fell outside of the two tenths. So 99% of our um, GNSS measurements were within two tenths of our, of our baseline data. Now moving on to photogrammetry, um, looking at the processing times, there's a lot of stuff here, so I'll try to explain this best I can because there's a couple different ways we had to look at this as well. So total time start to finish doing everything all in was about eight hours and 18 minutes. However, I do have this um, five hours and 40 minutes behind it because there's parts of this that we didn't necessarily have to uh, include in here. So what I mean by that is first we have to process the PPK data and process the photogrammetry. So this includes, you know, processing the PPK from the cloud system, you know, bringing it into the software and running the, you know, the initial orientation on it, constraining it to the ground control, you know, re-optimizing it, and then producing a full resolution point cloud. So we, we decided to go with the full res point cloud um, just to have the density match up with what we would be seeing with the with the LiDAR sensor. So that whole process took three hours and five minutes. And then there was optional processing that you don't have to do. I wanted to do it for this just to have it, but we created a full resolution orthomosaic. Um, that process took over right over two and a half hours. Now, again, that's that's not a requirement for what we're trying to do, but that's just an additional part of this. Now, if we look at the TBC side of it, we thought, okay, so are people gonna process in TBC or are they gonna take it to a third party? So we figured we better check both. So to bring the data into TBC, classify the point cloud down to different regions and then export out to a third party, that process took about 10 minutes. But if we wanted to do the full processing in TBC, which would be segmenting out the road, cutting our cross sections, creating our, our points along the curb and our line work and making our surface model to basically produce what we did with the GNSS, that took two hours and 25 minutes. So that's why there's different times here. One is the, to do everything, and then one is to just get it out to third party. Now there's a couple caveats you gotta also keep in mind when working with GNSS, or I mean with uh, photogrammetry data, is that not all the processing time is required by someone physically being at the computer. A lot of that is just pushing the button and letting the computer go. And then you also have the, the, the power of your computer. Obviously, you know, I have a processing computer that's gonna run through data a lot faster than my laptop. So those are all these things you have to also consider. And then this is just a screen snap of the data um, from the, the local photogrammetry processing around the curb and gutter here. Um, you can see my points and my line work that we pushed through. And then I want you to kind of keep in mind this dark area here as we, as we go through these and we can see how this kind of evolves here. Looking at it from cloud, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not there yet. So a couple more slides on this. So we had 117 photos um, that we processed locally. So here's just an example of one of the Sony images, a very um, crisp image, high resolution camera. You know, our PIX4D um, report, everything looked pretty good there for our processing. Uh, we created a full resolution point cloud. So we had about um, one point per pixel, gave us 163 million points. Um, you can see looking down at the point cloud, which you see on the screen here, um, it looks looks really good. But when we threw a limit box in there and started turning it on the side, we were noticing some things that concerned us a little bit. So you can see there's plenty of detail, but now when we flip it on the side, we're looking at one of our targets here and you can see there's a lot of noise in this data. There's a lot of kind of uh, fuzz in the curb and the, the road surface. So um, we were interested in seeing how that was gonna kind of play out through the rest of this. But the ortho mosaic we got through it looked really, really good. Um, and we we're happy with that. So looking at that data and comparing it to our control points, again, the same thing, our, our surface model from our fo local photogrammetry, comparing it to the control, we had three points um, that fell outside of our two centimeter threshold. 
and then we only had one point that fell outside of our uh, our one tenth. So I was actually kind of surprised at how well that worked. I was I was I was happy with what we saw there. Now when we look at that same cross section, you can look at the data kind of from a different perspective here. You can see how much fuzz and how much noise there is in there. Now that explains some things obviously when we start comparing a full resolution surface model, right? There's a lot of a lot of um, noise here, but that can be caused by various things due to you know weather and lighting and camera settings and things like that. And typically when I make a surface model of this, I'm probably gonna sample it down to make that more of a you know a consistent surface and not so noisy but again we went all in full resolution so um, there's what you see for the uh, the cross-section view and then lastly getting to this um, this is the comparison compare the um, me comparing the photogrammetry surface again to those total station uh, cross sections we took and some of these points I have crossed out here and I just want to explain that what that is is you know we took these um, we, we collected this data at various times and various days and it's the fall here in Minnesota, so we went through because we had some outliers and there's different spots where there was, you know, a pile of leaves in the gutter line or something like that. So any of those points where there's some question where there's missing data or there's stuff in the gutter of the road or debris that we have to deal with, we just threw those points out. So that's why they're crossed out. Um, so looking at the data, 46%, um, so 35 out of 76 of our photogrammetry points or checks fell within our two centimeter uh, threshold. If we bump that up to a tenth, we did a little bit better. We're up to 66%, so over half. And then when we go up to two tenths, um, actually all but one of them with the local photogrammetry fell within two tenths. So we were pretty happy with that. Now taking that same data and pushing it through a cloud-based system, we wanted to see, okay, what's gonna be different? So photogrammetry, cloud-based, that process took about 45 minutes. And that was really just to upload the data I chose to mark the, the ground control manually and then download the completed data when it was done. And typically that's ready, you know, next day, same day. I think I did it in the morning and it was probably done in the evening sometime. So not a lot of work involved into getting that uh, that data up there. And for this one, um, using Dell Air's platform, uh, we can also use different processing engines. So we wanted to make sure we used a different processing engine to see if we got different results. So here's just kind of some pictures of their interface um, of the, 2D and the 3D, uh, the point cloud view on their platform. And then now looking at the data, so we had 117 photos. Once we had figured out with um, being able to reproject point clouds in Trimble Business Center, that made processing in here a little bit easier because their platform didn't support our local system at the time. So we just processed this in US state plane, brought the point cloud into TBC and reprojected it like we did. Um, earlier and it worked just fine. So uh, we created a full resolution point cloud. Again, you can see it looks really good. But what was interesting is when we took that limit box and looked at the same place, this is the same place we looked at with the other data set. As you can see, there's a lot less noise in this data set. It's a lot cleaner. Um, and I was very impressed when I saw that. And then also we got the ortho mosaic and the DSM, which was all, which was all part of that um, online processing. Comparing that surface model from the cloud-based photogrammetry to our control, everything hit within two centimeters. We didn't have any outliers. Looking again at the cross section, you can see there's a lot less noise. It's a lot more um, consistent in terms of the, the noise and the data and the surface we have from our point cloud. And then looking at this uh, same image here, again, there's different ones that had to be crossed out because it was a different day. Um, actually it was the same day, but I think our points um, where they fell within our surface model was different. I should, I should re-say that. But looking at this, um, we had 62% fell within our uh, two centimeter threshold. 76% uh, fell within a tenth. And 96% fell within um, two tenths. So, we were better in the two centimeters and the tenth than processing it locally, but we were a little bit worse on um, the two tenths, which I found was kind of interesting. But um, again, here's here's what we ended up with. So what does this tell us about photogrammetry? Well, obviously it has its time and its place, no doubt. We all know that. Everybody um, these days seems to use it. But if it's done properly, it can definitely be accurate enough for certain situations. Um, I maybe wouldn't use it on a hard road surface like this, but definitely for, for other things, um, certainly a great tool. 
Um, there are too many variables, however, in the field in the office to have a one size fits all solution. So, you know, you have different software algorithms as we just saw here will provide different answers. Um, so just keep in mind, it's up to you as a professional to, to determine, you know, what's good, what's bad, what should I use? Um, you know, one of our recommendations that we do here is to utilize proper standard operating procedures within your company just to make sure, you know, you have proper training, you know, on your sensors and your software and everybody's consistent and doing, doing the same thing. And then no matter what you hear, you always need ground control. Okay, you hear that a lot, you know, survey grade this, survey grade that, no ground control this, no ground control that. You cannot validate your data if you don't have any checkpoints or any ground control to report your accuracy to. So always have something on the ground to validate your data every time you do this. Moving on to aerial LIDAR. So processing the data here took us two hours and 42 minutes to go all in with TBC and 31 minutes to just get it out to third party. So that includes, you know, post-processing the, the trajectory and GPS in Aplanix, creating the LAS files out of Cloud Station, registering it to ground control and TBC and exporting to third party, and then to create the line work and the surface model and things like that. And TBC took about another two hours and 11 minutes. So start to finish about two hours, 42 minutes. Here's that same curve. Um, again, you can see my points and my line work that I drew around that curve. Hopefully, you kind of start to see a little bit more definition. I don't know how this comes across in the in this on your screen, but a little bit more definition in this dark spot here. And then now analyzing the data. So we had about 10.2 million points. We didn't decide to go with color. Um, there are cameras that you can add to this yellow scan system. We had them. We decided not to use them just because it was one of our first times flying it. We just wanted to collect data. Me personally, I very rarely use color when I process point cloud data anyways, um, but it's there if you need it. The data looked nice and clean. Um, I don't know if it shows up good because it's a darker color, but this is a big tree that was overhanging and there's plenty of uh, data that made it through and, and penetrated down to the ground, which was another thing we were looking at with the sensor, which we're pretty happy with. But then one another, uh, another kind of hurdle or a roadblock we ran into was how we flew this um, flight. So this was something we didn't think about that we had to figure out how to deal with after the fact is when you're flying with this, you know, with an aerial lighter, typically your, your laser is spinning perpendicular to your flight path. Well, we're flying along a curved road. So when we're making our turns, we're getting these areas of kind of dead space where the LIDAR is missing because that drone is rotating. Um, so we freaked out a little bit, but really it wasn't that big of a deal because for how we were processing this data in TBC, we had some tools in there where we could we could pretty much get by that and make it a non-issue. But again, it's just something to be aware of. So we wanted to make sure we presented on that. Uh, looking at the yellow scan surface model and comparing it to our control data, we only had one outlier that was over two centimeters and that was just, uh, it was it was 700. So it really wasn't that bad. So everything looked very good here from kind of what our expectations were. Um, the only potential explanation, this is just a theory, so I'm not saying this is why, but this particular point fell in one of those areas where we didn't have, you know, wasn't as dense as it is here. So I don't know if it had a little bit of a harder time making a road surface there or not, but that's just a, a theory that I have. Um, looking at the cross section, you can see um, it fits the total station cross section very, very well. There is a little bit of noise in the data, but Honestly, that doesn't concern me because again, I'm not going to make a full resolution surface model of my road. If I tried to bring that into CAD, it's probably gonna crash. So I'm typically gonna sample that out and that's gonna take care of any of that noise or fuzz in there and still provide me a good result. You can see it fit the, the, the curb on both sides very well. So I was happy with what we saw there. And then looking at this, uh, when we flew this, we had to throw three points out because I think there was some trash or something in the in the gutter of the road. But comparing that that surface model to our total station um, cross section points, we had 81% uh, of our checks fell within two centimeters. So that was I was really surprised. 60 out of 74 were within our two centimeter mark. 86%, um, a little bit better, fell within that tenth. And then we had um, three of them that fell outside of the two tenths. Um, so again, um, very, very good. Okay, lastly, moving on to mobile LIDAR. So the processing time here, um, start to finish was three hours and 49 minutes. 
and then to get it out the third party was 37 minutes so the 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 steps involved in that were you know processing the trajectory and the gps in pospack bringing it into tbc's mobile mapping module and running the point cloud generation they have a nice uh, mobile mapping um, ground control registration process that we used in there and then classifying the point cloud into regions and exporting it out you could bring it into say infraworks or something like that um, running through and making the line work and the in the curb and gutter and everything and the surface models and tbc um, that took three hours and 12 minutes this actually took me a little longer and i have two reasons why one was it was the first time i did it i actually processed this data before the other ones and then there was just so much detail i found myself kind of getting lost in the point cloud where i was just really trying hard to make everything perfect and if i did it again i probably wouldn't have to be so um detail oriented because i could still get a good good uh a good product out of it but it just took me a little bit longer because i was i was kind of learning in the process and just really trying to make a nice map there here's a, a screen snap of that same curve now we were saying you know look at these dark spots as we go through here and so on now you can really start to see the detail and what those dark spots were is actually some um, potholes and imperfections in the road and when you get into the mobile scan data this is where this stuff really starts to jump out um, we can even see all the seams and the cracks in the road and the manhole cover. So we're dealing now with, with a very high resolution data and a lot of detail. Um, the point cloud itself was about 55 and a half million points. So, you know, again, that took just under a minute to collect. So we got a lot of data in a short amount of time. The point cloud was colorized, but you don't have to do that step. But this was by far the cleanest data set with the most detail. This is an elevation-based rendering, so you can really see those potholes in the road kind of jump out at you. And then cutting that kind of that uh, limit box side view, you can see there's not a lot of fuzz or noise in that point cloud. It looked really nice. And, and I didn't show numbers for this, but one other thing I just kind of roughly checked was without tying it to GCPs, how close did I get to this stuff? And this was definitely the closest to our our control point without actually constraining it down to ground control but we just decided to tie everything down um, just to make it even and then we also had the additional imagery so with the 360 camera you kind of get this 360 street view so this is one view looking back the same thing looking forward here you can see is where all those those imperfections in the roads were that we were looking at is right here we also have the forward facing and the downward facing cameras for signs and pavement inspection and things like that so you get a lot of extra um, stuff with it too that you can use. Um, looking at the MX-9 surface and comparing it to the control data, everything fell within within our two centimeter threshold. So um, we didn't have anything too alarming to see there. And then looking at our um, cross-section view, you can see we have a really nice clean um, surface here of the road. And I actually think the more I look at this, I actually think this is probably a better representation because I can see you know, like the apron here and, and things like that. And it looks really good in the in the curb area as well. Looking at the uh, MX-9 surface model, comparing it to our total station cross sections, there was, uh, looks like five points we had to throw out um, because of stuff on the road. But 88% uh, of those points, so 63 out of 72 fell within two centimeters. 94% um, fell within a tenth and 100% of our points, so every single point was under two tenths um, that we used to check. So we're pretty happy with those results. All right, so total collection and production time. So this is a graph just putting it all in one spot. So field collection is the white um, blocks, the office processing is the red blocks, and this is just to basically produce a point cloud, get it off to a third-party software. Um, GPS, hour and a half. Photogrammetry is three hours and 45 minutes. Again, keeping in mind, you know, the computer side of this where some computers will be faster than others and you don't have to be pushing buttons that whole time. Um, aerial LiDAR and, and the mobile LiDAR were pretty comparable um, with right around the two hour mark, a little bit less. So everything was pretty um, flat across the board on the processing side. When we throw in the time to make line work and a surface model and, and everything there, we get a little bit higher. So the GPS cross sections um, start to finish with data collection and producing took about four hours and 20 minutes. Photogrammetry was about six hours and 10 minutes. 
Um, aerial LiDAR was about four hours and 10 minutes and mobile LiDAR was about five hours. So again, everything was pretty consistent. So what we're finding as we do this is the office processing side of this really to create everything start to finish, there's not a lot of an advantage one way or the other using you know uh, mobile scanning or GPS. It's all pretty much the same. So we really have to look is, is in the data collection time because we ran through this several times and, and really there wasn't one thing that jumped out that was more of an advantage over the other in terms of collect or, uh, processing the data. And then this is just a slide to put it all in, in one place so you can kind of see everything together. So the, the red towers are the two centimeter results, the blue towers are the one tenth results, and the yellow towers are two tenths. So you can see um, you know, everything was pretty consistent at two tenths. We get some dips when we get into the um, you know, the the two centimeter and the one tenth, but you can kind of see how everything fits together there just in one place. So quick summary, um, I know we're right up against our time here, so I want to get to questions. So GNSS, obviously a great tool for topography and cross sections. It can be time consuming in the field, however, on large projects, but typically it's the easiest in terms of usability to process and make maps from. One thing I didn't mention though is in my mind, one of the downsides of GPS is it just still requires somebody to physically be on the road. That's one aspect that all the other systems really kind of throw out. Um, photogrammetry, Great way to cover a large area of ground. You know, works for great rough topo, but typically it's the least accurate method um, that we see. Um, definitely to know your software and your have proper SOPs for consistency. Um, things you have to be aware of are your camera settings. So like your aperture, your ISO value. You know, you have to think about your lighting, you know, shutter speed. You know, things like that. Um, definitely use a good quality UAV and a camera to get quality data. I always use um, ground control to validate your data and you know that way you know it's right. Um, and then uh, this is just a quote from uh, one of my colleagues, Bob Green out in New Mexico is, you know, with photogrammetry, don't contour the top of hay. It won't get you bare earth. Um, so just keep that in mind. The processing is very computer intensive, but it doesn't require a lot of manual in intervention. It's a lot of just click and let it go. Um, and then, you know, what I found on this process is I say just take it to the cloud. Not only did I get better results, but it was just a lot easier to deal with. I didn't have to worry about it. I just upload it and I get an email when it's done and I bring it in and I can start looking at it. Aerial LiDAR, what a, it was a great tool. Um, it was accurate, very effective. It was easy to use. The quality was better than photogrammetry. As you can see, it wasn't quite as good as mobile LiDAR, but, you know, that's, that's no surprise to us. That's about what we expected. Um, if you have an aerial solution, you know, with the right sensor, you can definitely penetrate vegetation, which we saw in one of the slides. A um, couple things is just be aware of your area of interest and how you fly it. You know, we had that issue going around the curve where we're missing some data. And then always adjust and validate, you know, your, your, your flight with ground control. And then, you know, utilize the power of TBC, um, not to shamelessly plug TBC, but it really was kind of our saving grace in this project because, you know, any issue that we had that was related to a projection or coordinate system, we were able to figure it out and make it work. So um, working in local sites, definitely uh, take a look at that. And then the mobile LiDAR stuff, I mean, obviously no, no, uh, it's not a secret that it, you know, it really blew us away. It worked really well, um, it was fast, it was accurate, probably not a feasible um, solution to use on 1600 feet of road or even a mile of road, might be overkill, but definitely in those longer projects, it really, um, it really shines. Um, you get the added benefit of imagery, you know, and the brunt of the office work is, is our brunt of the work is in the office, so it's not dependent on the weather. You don't have to have people in the roadway. Uh, and I just want to throw an example here of, of a project um, for BP way up in the North Slope in Alaska, more of a real world scenario. You know, they scanned 250 miles of, of road in about three and a half days. You know, they had some speed restrictions. They had to stay under a certain, you know, speed limit. But then they pulled out, you know, 613 miles of line work in TBC in about 120 hours. So that's just kind of a, maybe a large scale, um, real world um, scenario that you can kind of digest there. All right, with that said, um, that's a lot of information. Hopefully I didn't go too fast. I wanted to make sure we got right around that hour mark, but it looks like we have um, several questions here. Um, Dylan and Nathan, hopefully, are you still there? 
Yep, still here. All right, so I'm gonna scroll up and look at some of these questions here. Uh, yeah, one question was from Phil about the glass beads we use. Phil, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that offline. I'll send you a link to that. Um, there was a question about the cross sections at 100 feet. How valid would how valid will your surface be relative to the lidar? So that's a good question. I mean, obviously there's you know things that can go on within 100 feet, but I feel like for 100 foot cross sections, that's pretty standard for what we were trying to do to validate our you know our accuracy, our total our, our GPS data we did a lot closer. Um, but even comparing the LiDAR data to the GPS, it really didn't make any difference. 100 feet just is kind of what we chose and it, and it worked well for us. I don't know, do you guys have any other comments on that? Maybe we should have done them closer or what are your thoughts? Yeah, not, not too much more to add to that other than, you know, the shorter intervals definitely going to give you a, a better representation of what the road surface looks like. Um, you know, as long as we're comparing apples to apples um, across the different sensors with our with our cross sections, I think things worked out pretty well. Right, right. And you know, the other thing too is this is kind of a you know, it's it's one of those things where you when you do it, you end up finding about oh, we should have done this, we should have done that. So um, obviously, there's other things we could add to it, and we can do that. We might do at some point in time. Um, so maybe going back out with more cross sections is maybe something we can do at some point and see if it changes the results. But I don't expect in this particular situation, just because it's a relatively flat road and and not a lot going on, I don't expect it to change much. Um, but it's something we could look at. Um, next question was is in the Dell Air AI platform. Um, I had mentioned that we used a different processing engine, um, and the question was which one do we use in the study? So obviously the the local photogrammetry that we use was was Pix4D, and um, the Dell Air platform, you have a couple of options depending on what you're trying to do. So you can use the Pix4D engine, um, which we certainly could have done, but we wanted to do something different. Um, there's also an option to use the Agisoft MetaShape engine, and then there's an option to use the Bentley, uh, excuse me, the Bentley Context Capture image. And in this particular one. Um, I had used Bentley Context Capture before, so I kind of knew what I was going to get, but I really had never used Agisoft Metashape. So the Dell Air AI platform is, is uh, we chose Agisoft Metashape, uh, was what we used to process that data. Um, let's see what else we got here. Whoops. If the flight time of the UAS platform better matched the battery life of the LiDAR battery, wouldn't that reduce the total cost or the total collection time? So I think what the what the question there is, is, you know, we had to do several flights um, with the LiDAR, but, but, you know, a good point there is that was due to battery life on the drone. That wasn't due to battery life on the LiDAR. So um, one thing we didn't cover here is you could also, um, there are solutions, especially with that, that yellow scan um, LiDAR. There's an example, uh, Quantum Systems, they have a fixed wing, you know, that you could put the VX, uh, I believe the VX20, or no, um, one of the yellow scan systems in, and, you know, then you have an hour plus of, of collection time. So, yeah, there's definitely options there, um, Cliff, and the, the, the total kind of factor there is, is the battery life of the drone is typically the problem. So, yes, we could be a lot more efficient if we used a drone that had, um, battery times that were more comparable to the LiDAR. That's that's uh, definitely correct. Uh, the question was, why did you drive the MX-9 at 30 miles an hour um, as the MX-9 allows you to drive faster? It definitely does. Um, it's just we were on a we were on a uh, street in a business park. Um, I would have loved to, I, Dylan, you probably would have loved to rip through there at about 50 miles an hour, but it just wasn't... Uh, something we could safely do so that's why we um that's why we did that and then also in more of a i don't want to say urban but urban-esque type setting that we're in you know here we don't have any um, situations where we'd be able to drive any faster so that's why we chose what we did um there was a question about feature codes uh, we did use feature codes in the gnss um, survey um, but even with the feature codes we still wanted to go back through and make sure all the um, the lines were, were curving and stuff and we're, we're having nice curves and things pushed through there. 
Um, oh, this is a long one. Let me just uh, scroll down here. So it says, can you speak to the fact that for most projects you will need um, need a ground survey to accompany the remote survey for culvert signs, utilities, and anything obscured? What is the break point in miles where it makes more sense to use the ground survey for your surface as well as planometrics? That's a good question. I'm going to pawn that off on, on you guys, Dylan and Nathan. What are your thoughts on that since you have more real-world experience with this? Well, just for me personally, working with the uh, mobile LiDAR sensor, um, yeah, there's there's time involved with collecting ground control. There's um, time involved in the planning of the route and everything, and just making sure that you can drive the route, first of all. Um, but when it comes to kind of where that break point is, um, each, what I would say, each survey firm is probably going to have a a bidding system where they take it either by mile or by block or whatever their um their scale is and and they have a dollar amount for that um, so when you compare approximately how long it would take to do a section of a road um, traditionally with the control versus with a mobile lidar sensor it's probably not going to um, make the most sense on a smaller scale project versus when you start getting into a much longer project where you have three to five plus miles. That's where I've found that the um, mobile light starts to make some starts to make more sense. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, relative cost to achieve each of these results. Um, that is a good question that I'm not sure I can answer because it could go various ways. I mean, obviously you have, you know, cost of equipment, right? You know, when we're talking, we get up into aerial LiDAR, mobile LiDAR, obviously the, the price tag goes up, you know, the ROI is different. Um, but you also have to factor in, you know, not just equipment costs, but cost to be on site so the cost um per crew per hour um i don't know if i can really answer that question i don't know dylan or nathan if you guys have any insight on that but it's it's really kind of depends on the situation i would say okay no comment i don't know. <laughs> I have anything more to add to that one okay. sorry jay <laughs> yeah, no worries no worries um ballpark figure on various i'm not sure what that is but the various methods including the level of skills required to operate them so um obviously when you're talking you know photogrammetry you know you have at least in the united states you know you have your you have to have your 107 and and some various level of training and ability to fly you know drones that's that's one aspect of it that translates over to the lidar side um in terms of the the flight and the data collection um nathan with the yellow skin or the the lighter i don't think there's really anything too special you have to know i mean if you can fly a drone you can pretty much fly the yellow scan it's just basic mission planning and some manual calibration maneuvers right yeah you're exactly right the mission planning is a little bit different and there's um manual procedures to initialize that imu but other than that you're still mission planning and letting the drone do the flying for you right so um, so the operation of the drones is, is pretty much consistent. Um, the MX-9, honestly, is is super easy to use. There's a little bit of setup time, but, you know, once it's in, it's basically just putting a pushing a button to record and pushing a button to stop record, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and, and something I'll add to that is, you know, a lot of people who are doing mobile scanning, you know, this is, uh, becomes kind of a niche for them. And, um, a lot of companies that are investing in this type of technology are actually dedicating a, a, a vehicle towards their mobile scanner. So it might not always be an hour of setup and teardown. Um, it might just be a matter of you know five minutes or so uh, to set it up. Um, so obviously with our situation, we don't have a dedicated vehicle. So it does take a little bit more time and knowledge to um, um kind of outfit the vehicle there and um as far as operating procedures it's 
Uh, it, it really is just as simple as hitting a green button and a red button. Right. Yeah. On, on our situation, we had to install all the the bracketing for the system onto the onto the vehicle and and hook up the battery and all that type of stuff. Where if you had a dedicated system, it's basically just putting the MX9 up there, locking it in place, and plugging it in. So there's there's definitely a difference there. Um, one comment, um, just correcting me or, or filling in when I was talking about the LiDAR system on the, the Quantum fixed wing, you know, talking about more battery life and more efficiency, it's the Surveyor and the Surveyor Ultra, it's not the, uh, the VX series, so sorry if I misspoke there. Um, question, do you have a cost-benefit ratio for the various methods, cost of equipment, time, etc.? Um, I think that kind of goes back to the previous question. Obviously, there are various different price tags and scenarios here and different configurations thereof. There's single laser and dual laser and stuff. So I don't have anything um, canned or on paper that I can can give you. But, you know, if you had something more specific, definitely reach out to us on the side and, and we can kind of take that offline and, and maybe crunch some numbers and figure that out for you a little bit easier versus trying to kind of shoot from the hip here. Um, and then the last question here, uh, seen black holes and warping of the ortho photo when processing, usually on the vertical edges building, et cetera, even when performing cross flight collection patterns for added data, your photos seem clean and clear. Did you see any types of issues? Process yeah, so um, Sean, I did see that on a lot of the buildings, um, pretty standard. Obviously a lot of the um, focus was on the road, which, for the most part looked really good but when we started looking at some of the buildings we definitely saw some of those weird um, swirls along the edges and some and in the point cloud some some holes in the sides of the building now we only flew this as a single grid one thing that did come up in a when i presented this one one other place was to fly in a um excuse me fly in a uh, double grid um but even with that i've i've seen some of those same things that uh, that you're talking about there so definitely um didn't come into play here cuz we were more worried about the road but we definitely saw that okay um that looks like all of our questions um there were some questions about making this available so uh what we do with all of our webinars this has been recorded and we will uh post this on our survey blog, so it's just frontierprecision.com, I believe it's forward slash blog. Um, so with probably by the end of the week, we'll have a recording of this up there, and I'll see if we can um, put a PDF together of the slides here for you as well. Um, but I don't see any questions up there, so uh, I guess with that, I guess I'd like to thank everybody for attending, and uh, we'll talk to you next time.